Welcome to AI, Government and the Future, a podcast by Corner Alliance. We explore the intersection of artificial intelligence, government and the future with your host, Alan Pence. We work with government to create results. We ignite your agency's mission by helping you to design and implement high impact and innovative federal programs in AI, broadband, cybersecurity, public safety and more. Being a government ally is at the core of all we do. Introducing your host, Alan Pence. Today we are joined by Mark Abbott, who is the founder of 90.io. My company is a user of that software, so go check it out. We love it. And Humalytics, he has decades of experience in building and investing, and, and he has a unique perspective on how AI intersects with the changing nature of work. He's challenged traditional views on AI, emphasizing the need for useful intelligence, not just artificial intelligence, right? An information-saturated world. And he's about to come out with an awesome new book called Work 9.0. So like I was on 1.0, Mark's already at 9. So we're going to learn about that today. So welcome to the show, Mark. We're so happy to have you. Thanks, Alan. I'm delighted to be here. So let's just get right into it. What is Work 9.0 and what am I going to be doing it? So um, we're coming out of the seventh age of work, which is the age of information. And we all know how we got there, right? It's been a long journey, but, you know, each of the prior ages contributed to, you know, what I call useful information, which is information that sort of stands the test of time and information that evolves to make life better. So I'm very optimistic. I've listened to a bunch of your podcasts. I know you've had a number of people on the show who are optimistic. And so count me as one of those people, right? But the problem with the current age or age 7.0 was that, you know, we're all just overwhelmed with information. There's just so much out there and it's almost like there's an information war, misinformation, malinformation. But, you know, what we do know is there's just an extraordinary amount of information that's out there and, you know, we're overwhelmed by it. We don't know friend or foe. It's clearly challenging a lot of the traditional, you know, sort of uh, hierarchies, specifically, you know, status-based hierarchies. And it's challenging, obviously, a lot of the traditional business models, whether it's, you know, media as an example. And it's also challenging governments right now. So huge amount of information. It's overwhelming us. When we get overwhelmed, we get insecure. When we get insecure, if we are part of a group, we kind of cling tighter to that group. And that's why, you know, tribalism, we're all tribal, right? But that's why it's unhealthy tribalism as opposed to healthy tribalism, right? Well, our tribe's helping yours. So we went into the seventh age. We got all this access to all this information, some of it useful, not some of it not so useful. And I believe that COVID plus generative AI is transitioning, helping us move into the next age, which I call the age of understanding. So that's the eighth age, right? Where it's like, hey, let's really understand what the heck all this information is doing for us and to us. And really, let's focus on finding the useful information, the signal inside of the noise, as a lot of people refer to it. And so, you know, I don't know how long we're going to be in this age, but the ages tend to get shorter and tighter. But we're in this age, I think, now where we're going to start really trying to understand what the heck, you know, is all this information is, what's useful, what's not so useful. And you see the pendulum swinging a little bit right now, you know, in terms of, you know, it's like the, a lot of the peer group, you know, research, you know, you're seeing that come under pressure right now. People are saying, well, wait a second, is this, all these studies, are they, you know, especially behavioral studies, right? Are they, you know, were those accurate or not? And so there's lots of stuff that I think is appropriately being questioned as we move into this age of understanding. So that's work 9.0. And then I believe that we're evolving up Maslow's hierarchy, right? And so, you know, ultimately the next stage would be, work 9.0 will be where 10% of a healthy society at least is feeling like they they love life. They're actualizing, they're doing the work that they love doing. They're making life better. They are in groups or societies or companies where they genuinely feel like they're thriving. And so coming out of 7.0, moving into 8.0, Someday, you know, I deeply believe we'll move into nine o, which is where you know, just good portion of society genuinely loves being alive and and on the journey that it's on. 
Interesting. So take us on a quick tour of work one through through six, I guess, before. So, and I don't have them all memorized anymore, right? But I mean, the first age of work, you know, is sort of the hunter gatherers, right? And everybody's nomadic and that goes back, what, 20,000 years. Then you move into the, so see if I can get this all right, right? So then you move into the agrarian age, right? Where we now have some tools, right? That help us plow the earth and help us create crops and really start, you know, that's the beginning of when we move from being sort of nomadic to settling down, right? And so that's the second age of work. And then, you know, it's during that age of work where we all, because we've settled down, because we actually create enough food to take care of us and others that we didn't have to work all day long, just making sure that we had food and water and we're moving from place to place to place. And so, you know, it's during that second age where you start to see people really, you know, contemplating things, the Socrates, the Plato's, the Aristotle's, right? Where we start to have enough time to think about thinking and things like that. So that's the second age. See if I can get all this right, bud. Then we move into the next stage, which is is really the sort of the beginning of the industrial age, right? Which is the invention of the steam engine and obviously turning the loom into a mechanically driven thing so that we could produce more and more clothing. And as you move into each of these ages, it does threaten some of the status quo, right? So obviously we know about, you know, in the 16 and the 17th, you know, and in the 1800s when all this stuff started to come about, all this innovation started to come about, it threatened the guilds as an example. And so there's always tension as we move through these transitions. So that's the third age, right? And then the fourth age would be when we start to move into sort of the industrialization, right? Where we're factories and things like that. And then the fifth age would be the microprocessor. And then the sixth age would be sort of the beginning of the internet. And then, of course, that's sort of the beginning of the internet. But And then the seventh age, obviously, is at what point did we start to have all of us have all this access to, you know, basically almost all the knowledge in the world? Sort of like the cloud, almost a little bit, right? And so it sounds like each age, a couple of things there. One, transition is driven by technology. The advancement of useful information. Right. There you go. And then two, cycles shortening the time length between cycles. So there's some kind of like compounding effect there, obviously, out of the technology, right? And then three was a disruption. But ultimately, each phase leads to greater human well-being and larger population, right? I mean, that might be changing now. I don't know. I mean, the statistics are pretty clear that that's short of someone introducing some new technology to make it easy to replace populations, which is not a thing that I don't think about, right? So it's a thing I do think about, right? But yeah, I mean, we know China's, that a lot of the world is now actually experiencing negative population growth. And so, you know, they're predicting what by the end of this, that we'll cap out at, I forget the numbers off the top of my head, but we'll cap out at what, eight or so billion, and it'll start to actually go the opposite direction. Which, you know, is not necessarily a bad thing. Once again, you go back to what is this all about? And ultimately, you know, it's I think we're evolving to make life better and better and better for, you know, a larger and larger percentage of humanity. To some extent, I guess there's a debate on that transition to agriculture. Was that actually a good thing for humans? And I think there's quite a bit of debate among anthropologists and people. So it does seem like we've been moving in an upward direction, but I guess there is some possibility that one age could lead to another age that wouldn't be as beneficial to humans. So I'm an optimist. I believe that evolution is simply the incessant and unrelenting stacking of useful information, right? And that over the long run, we're making life better. Now, you know, there's cyclical attributes to history and then then we stack and we learn and we stack and we learn and and when i say stacking it goes actually in both directions right it's interpolation and extrapolation of things that we know to create you know more useful information and get rid of stuff that maybe we thought was smart that isn't smart like using leeches to take out blood for the most part right that still actually has some benefit there's still some uses for leeches in that regard but it's very very specific now right so, but yeah, we're stacking and interpolating and extrapolating and continuing to evolve useful information. And if you stand back and you look at, you know, 
I don't care. Look at life through 10, 15 different lenses, literacy, you know, percentage of children that actually make it to adulthood, you know, on and on and on. Life's gotten a heck of a lot better for the average person you know, across the world, across history. So, and then you're kind of relating this also to, Ma we ref you referenced Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is going from, you know, the need to eat, to then to have shelter and each one stacked and ultimately goes to self-actualization. The sort of the work age is almost mimic that to some extent, I guess, right? Exactly, right. If you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and if we were to do this, and I actually have tried to do the research and it's not easy. And maybe with ChatGPT, it's it's easier, but I've struggled with it. You know, what percentage of humanity is each of those five levels? And so, you know, part of my mission is to drive up the average over the next 10 years. That's an interesting concept as well. Something I haven't heard. Like, so you're seeing, you know, there's a continuum of whatever it is, well-being or where somebody is on the on the scale. I think you're careful to say, like, not everyone's going to go into self-actualization all at once, right? It's going to be a lot of laggards, but as long as the vanguard keeps advancing, then others kind of move behind that, right? Well, but if you talk about the average person on the planet right now, we're actually going backwards, right? Uh, there's a statistic that in the last 20 years, the percentage of, of humans that live within a totalitarian-based regime versus a relatively free country has gone from 46% lived under a tal under totalitarian or authoritarian a regime to 72% in the last 20 years. And it's not a very good statistic, obviously, right? And the average well-being of an individual in a free society versus an authoritarian society, you know, is fundamentally different, right? Because you're dependent upon someone else. You don't have access to all of the unalienable rights that the founders of the United States got to give the vast majority of the citizens back then. And obviously, we know we didn't start the best in terms of get, making sure every single citizen had access to, you know, had their full unalienable rights. But they tried to create a society that respected rights. Although some of that could be what a reclassification of India or something, because that you know, if you're talking 72 or 75 percent being totalitarian, that would have to take into account India, right? And I get people don't love Modi, but not quite sure it's totalitarian. And I'm not even sure. Maybe that's part of what they're pushing. That statistic puts India in that category. But you know, if you look at it, there's a lot more than just one country that's moved into that category in the last 20 years. And so let's go back. So you had mentioned you know now leaving this information the 7.0. And you had talked about this overwhelming amount of information and, and the impact on government. And since we focus on government here, we'll take that. How do you see that affecting government? What does that mean, the overwhelming information? And how does that impact that sector? Well, I mean, let's just look at national politics, right? And if you, there's no question that like the two parties are further apart today than they've, than they've been in decades in terms of sort of their perspectives. And, and so, you know, I would submit to you that, you know, part of 7.0 has been, like I said earlier, right, those two parties have become, you know, more tribal and against each other and less willing to listen to one another and sort of, you know, standing off hard against each other. And, and I look at it through the lens of, it's interesting, right? So one of the other things I write a lot about is trust. And I believe there are three dimensions to trust. There's character, there's competency, and there's connections. And connections is, you know, the most interesting one because it's values and it's goals and it's interests and agreements and, you know, rules and regulations and stuff like that, right? I would submit that right now, when it comes to these two parties, connections more important than competency and character. And which is like, how did we get here? And how does information drive that? I think it makes us insecure collectively. We tend to, when we're insecure, we tend to, to sort of grab our group and, and cling to our group's perspective. And so from a self-awareness and other awareness perspective, I think we become a little more insular. And so they're bad, we're good. And things that should be talked about are, are not as talked about. Conversations that should be healthy are not as healthy. And this is the result of I guess you're saying like a, you're a bit bombarded with information. You don't know what's true. So you retreat to 
look at this is classic, you know, misinformation or malinformation or whatever we're talking about. Fake news, right? Yeah, exactly. So how do you see AI driving us into the next era? Like, why is that the key technology? Well, ultimately, if AI evolves, and I think it will evolve to the point where it can help us see the stupid things, it could help us, you know, appreciate the stuff that's not black and white better, right? Help us be more open-minded, help us understand the things that, well, you know, there's this paper and it says, you know, X is true. And it's like, well, no, X is not true, right? The research actually does not support that particular point of view. And so ultimately my belief is that AI will help us over time clear out some of the non-useful or bad information that exists and therefore and thereafter improves the efficiency of us actually predominantly um, making decisions and having conversations around relatively useful information as opposed to having some weird point of view that may support someone's narrative, but it's actually if you really drill into it. Yeah. So, yeah, it makes sense. I guess it's, a again, as you said, you're an optimist. So many people in this field think exactly the opposite. I think it will create more mal and disinformation at scale. All right. So how do you answer that criticism? Yeah. Well, I would say that what happens if there's someone who creates sort of a better chatbot, as an example, right? You know, ultimately, you know, the vast, vast majority of humans, um, it's my, you know, belief, and I think the statistics are there to support this, you know, 95% of people are generally good people. Yes, there's, you know, we can, can have a debate whether one, two, three, four, or five percent of humans are, you know, sort of wired to be antisocial, whether it's a sociopath or a psychopath. But there's no question that there, a percentage of humans are not necessarily super kind and good people. You know, I think you are going to have AI that's doing everything it can to be as useful and helpful as possible. And then, yeah, there's probably AI out there that's going to the antithesis of that. And But I go back to over time, you know, I believe you've got 7 billion years worth of data that shows that there's a stacking of useful information and that it, that it evolves for the better. And, you know, 20,000 years of, of human information that tends to support the same broader perspective. So I am optimistic that there are a lot of good people that are going to do everything they can to, to help us build AI that makes life better as opposed to AI that destroys life. And one of the roles, actually, I've started just thinking about for government and actually a lot of our nonprofit sector and even for-profit is, is creating trusted repositories of data that even if you have an AI that using something else, you know, you can compare it back to like maybe a trusted source and identify discrepancies. I think there's going to be a lot of ways that government, nonprofit, for-profit sectors are going to come together to stack the useful information and try to get rid of the other. We don't really know what that is yet, but obviously I think it's going to happen in some way. It's going to be innovative. And the other question I've always had too is what if, what if the AI gives us all these answers and we just don't want to hear them? What if it tells us the answer to global warming is to build nuclear plants everywhere, but nobody wants to do that? So have you thought about that at all? It's like that resistance, like if the answers aren't exactly what we want, are we going to be able to embrace them? Well, over the long run, deeply believe that we will accept more and more and more of the useful information. And so, you know, your example is a really good one, which is if we discovered that, not discovered, right? If it was, you know, sort of from a, a 99% probability that, that sort of a smart next generation a nuclear energy plant was good for society, you know, at some point, and maybe it's because we have no choice, right? But at some point, I believe that useful information will prevail. You know, a lot of the stuff is like on this, it's now gets into probabilities and what's our comfort with the probability, let's say it's 99.999. Well, someone's going to have to make a, a tough decision. You know, that's leadership. But hopefully you can get, you know, you can get leaders, whether they're political or or non-political leaders 
to really help us think through and advance our perspectives. I like that. It, it is an over time issue, right? So not everything's going to be like answer and then we go to it. So now let's talk a little bit about going from work 8.0 to nine. It's sort of what I can think of some things in my head, but is it really about sort of like AI is able to automate, able to take a lot of the work that makes people unhappy or doesn't contribute to their thriving, kind of automate all that or take it off human plates and then humans just do that part that makes them thrive? Is that sort of the idea? There's a, a whole process that's going to unfold. So, you know, and, and there's like, there's chicken and the egg here. So as an example, you know, I believe as a person who's led, you know, a number of companies, um, built companies, coached people, you know, I think that part of moving into to the top of Maslow's is self and others awareness. And so I think it's just as much about us better understanding ourselves. What are we interested in? What are we good at? What are we passionate about? What kind of groups are most healthy for us? How is our relationship? I talk about, you know, we have seven types of relationships as humans, right? And so we have relationships with stuff, right? We have relationship with ourselves. We have relationships with groups. We have relationships with ideas. We have relationships uh, with time, which is a really interesting one, right? We, right? we have a, a relationship with, with the universe. And I think I just missed one. But, you know, ultimately, huh? people, right? groups and others, right? And so ultimately, when you get towards the top, you have high trust relationships with all of these types. And to do that, a relationship by definition is a two-way thing. And so, you know, ultimately, and one of them is with yourself, right? So just becoming just, you know, more at peace with who you are and where you are in life's journey and, and how you matter and and to feel like you can, you know, you're continually to, to grow and sort of find yourself healthily challenged with the problems that you're taking on, which is how you matter. And so, you know, I think it's a combination of, of the AI helping ourselves understand ourselves better. Life is very complex. And I don't think anybody feels like we've solved all the issues that are associated with life and living on in this world. And so, yeah, there's no question that some jobs will go away and new jobs will be created. That's what history you know, 20,000 plus years worth of history shows us. There's an expression we use all the time at our company, we either win or we learn. And when it comes to learning, I, I believe that, that it's almost always a gift. That learning helps evolve the way we think, or it helps evolve the way we react, or it helps evolve some part of how we matter. And so there's no question there's going to be displacement, but hopefully everybody will be able to learn and grow and find new ways to matter. We win or we learn. I am going to attribute that to Jalen Hurts because I'm a, a Philadelphia Eagles fan. That's what he said after he lost the Super Bowl last year. So just I won't attribute that to you, Mark, but uh, just that, that's okay. And actually, I think some of this like AI helping you actually even think through what you want and who you are, you know, you see some, I think pie is sort of targeted toward this, right? Like you see some initial experiments with personal assistants and things like that that are actually like, oh, so you're saying this, did you mean this way or that way? It's, it's interesting to see that kind of develop. And then the other side of it's, you know, like I say, it's self and others awareness, right? So we use several tools in our company. We have three actually that help us appreciate each other, whether you're a high fact finder or a low fact finder, that's a thing called Colby. And we use a version of Myers-Briggs that's produced by Type Coach that helps us understand, you know, thinkers versus feelers and sensors versus, you know, intuitives and things like that. And and we also have a sense for one another's motivations. And I think we're virtual. So all of our numbers and our letters are on our names whenever we're doing Zoom calls, as an example. And I think we're pretty good at being aware of the other person and working with them. And they do the same for us, right? As an example, when you're dealing with an issue, it's much healthier to attack it from the feelings perspective first, right? And then attack it from the logical, right? And so, you know, that yin yang part of who we are, but some of us are much more logical and some of us are much more feeling oriented. And, you know, we understand this stuff. And so it's, you know, obviously some will understand it more than others, but, you know, just that self and others awareness component is crucial when you're working with people or trying or 
or trying to understand people where they're coming from. Yeah, well, maybe the AI would zap me when I try to solve my wife's problem instead of listening to her. That would be helpful. I could use that. <laughs> I call AI, but I've got a solution. It would say, you know, she just wants you to listen right now, Alan. And so given that you run several software companies, how do you see software evolving as a part of this revolution? For us, as an example, we know a lot about our clients and our clients will, every now and then will have questions. And so, you know, being able to sort of meet the client where they are ultimately on a one-to-one -one basis is where, where we envision our platform evolving to. So, you know, as an example, I understand that, you know, you're a, an entrepreneur and you're building a company. It's in an early stage of growth you know, at this particular, you've passed product market fit, but now you're dealing with figuring out how to scale. You're trying to figure out who to hire. And we know that this is who you are. And this is, these are the types of people you're going to need to complement who you are. You know, this is the nature of your industry. This is, you know, from a probabilities perspective, you know, these are some of the things you may want to think about attacking next. These are some things you don't need to worry about as much, you know, so ultimately leveraging it to just help us be better at helping. You know, what I think is interesting there is like somebody said that a lot of B2B SaaS software was really just something that people kept in Excel and then it got abstracted out into a workflow, right? You know, you could say 90 is maybe not Excel. It's like some, the alternative would be using a Google Doc or something. And really based on workflow and capturing data, uh, hard-coded cells or whatever you call it, and what I kind of heard from you is like, it's really not going to be as much about that as about understanding the data that you've gathered from thousands of clients to help better decision making by a person tailored to meeting them where they are, right? So that's going to be a big change in software. I mean, it's going to be much less about the workflow and more about interactive, I guess, data. Because I guess the workflow, people will just be able to ask for, right? I mean... You can just tell an AI, my example is, do I need a CRM when I can ask the AI, what are my top 10 sales leads and what do I need to do to advance them? And so that's an, a good example of ultimately say, hey, this is what my ideal client looks like. So generate me a list. But what I think you're saying is the software could be like, here's what you should think about for your ideal client because we t we've looked at it across or here's how you should approach this because of where you are in your client set. So it'll be more like customized data to you rather than like a workflow that you go through that systematizes. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. I think it's going to be a big switch for a lot of software companies out there. Well, excellent. So tell us when is the book coming out? First quarter is the goal right now. There's still a, some work being done on it. First book is always the hardest. I've only been working on it since uh, June of 20. But I'm also running, a, you know, I've got a day job, so. That's right. Did you use ChatGPT at all? Like in the, I guess it was, it only came up toward, sort of toward the end, but. Used it for some of the research on sort of describing how useful information's evolved uh, during each of the ages. It was underwhelming what it did for me. I was hoping it would be a little bit stronger there, but it did provide some good stuff. Yeah, exactly. Well, excellent. Well, we'll look forward to the book. Look for it. Work 9.0, I guess is the title for now. Do you have a subtitle yet or is that to I come? I do. I don't have it memorized. <laughs> <laughs> you had the ages. You got all the ages, but not the subtitle. But we'll get there. But excellent. Well, Mark, so great to have you on. Like, It's awesome to hear your vision of where things are going. And it's great to hear that optimism after a lot of the Doomer stuff. I talked to the the EU regulators earlier today. So this feels a lot better. So thank you very much. Yeah, the evolution is on our side. I agree. I agree. All right, Mark. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sam. AI, government, and the future is brought to you by Corner Alliance. To find out more about Corner Alliance and how we work with government to create results, visit our website at corneralliance.com and then make sure to search for AI Government Future in Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found and click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Corner Alliance, thanks for listening.